in this video, we're going to discuss energy expenditure. Now, you might have seen that the average person's energy expenditure requirements is estimated at 2,000 calories for a woman per day and 2,500 calories per day for a man. Now, these are averages. It turns out we actually know quite a lot about how an individual's energy expenditure can be calculated. We know the various components of energy expenditure, and we can use this to provide more precise dietary advice with respect to caloric needs to an individual. In this video, we're going to discuss the various components of energy expenditure. We're going to talk about how they're modifiable or how they differ between individuals. And then finally, we're going to apply these concepts to be able to estimate the total daily energy expenditure for an individual person. Now let's return back to a calorie. Remember, energy intake is determined as the amount of energy that is available from the food that we eat. This energy is contained within the chemical bonds of food. For example, triglycerides have 9 kilocalories per gram, whereas carbohydrates, like glucose on the right, have about 4 kilocalories per gram. If we want to match somebody's energy intake to their energy expenditure, and we want to give them advice about how much energy to consume, we need to know how much energy expenditure they're going to have. If we look at an individual's energy expenditure, we can see that it can be broken down into several components. Now, you might think the biggest component of energy expenditure is that run that you went on earlier today, how much exercise you had, or how physically active you are. But in fact, for the vast majority of people, the largest component of energy expenditure is their resting metabolic rate, or their resting energy expenditure, shown here on the left in red. The basal metabolic rate comprises about 60 to 70% of energy expenditure for most people. Exercise and non-exercise active thermogenesis are the amounts of calories that you burn while either you're exercising intentionally or just moving around in your day-to-day -day lives. Those are referred to as eat and neat. And those are modifiable based on your amount of physical activity. But for most people, that only comprises of 15 to 20% of their total metabolic rate. The fourth component is called the thermic effect of food. That's how many calories you burn digesting, absorbing, and transporting the calories that you eat. That's about 10% for most people. We're going to go through each of these parts of the metabolic rate to discuss how they varied between people. But first, let's look at the average composition of an average person. Most people, the majority of their body weight is muscle and fat, over 60% of their body weight, whereas other critical organs such as the brain, kidneys, liver, and the digestive system are relatively small relative to their muscle and adipose depots. However, if we look at how many calories are burned per day by each of these organs for an average person, you can see that a large number of calories, or the very high percent of the basal metabolic rate, is burned in these autonomous systems, such as the liver, digestive system, kidneys, heart, and brain. That's because whether you're exercising or not, those organ systems have to keep functioning. Your heart has to keep beating. Your kidneys have to keep filtering your blood. Your brain has to keep listening to this lecture. All of these require energy, and that's why the basal metabolic rate is such a high percentage of the metabolic rate of a person, because all of these things are happening, whether you're thinking about it or not. The last thing I want to draw your attention to on this slide is, for most people, a reasonably high percent of their body weight is fat mass, in this diagram, 21%. However, your adipose tissue, which comprises most of your fat mass, doesn't burn that many calories, only about 3% of your total calories. If we want to estimate somebody's energy expenditure, the best predictor is the amount of lean mass or fat-free mass that a person has. That is the amount of their body mass after subtracting for the metabolically inactive adipose tissue. As you can see on the left, if you plot the fat-free mass of a person versus their resting energy expenditure, you can see that there's a very tight correlation. About 85% of the energy expenditure can be predicted if you know somebody's fat-free mass. This is higher generally in men who tend to have higher fat-free mass and lower in women who tend to have lower fat-free mass. Therefore, if you know somebody's fat-free mass, you can go a long way towards predicting their energy expenditure. Again, that's because as a person is larger, those tissues are going to be burning more calories all the time, independent of their activity levels. Now, this relationship is still somewhat modified by several factors, one of which is age. As people age, their basal metabolic rate declines. Sex, it tends to be higher in males than females. Part of that is due to fat-free mass, but even after adjusting for fat-free mass, there's still a higher energy expenditure in men. The last part that is modified by is genetics. It is estimated that about 11% of the total variation in energy expenditure can be attributable to genetics. 
If you include the genetic component of fat-free mass, which is also heritable, now about 85% of energy expenditure can be predicted by genetics. Now, what does that mean? Let's take a bit of a digression to talk about how traits are heritable. Shown here is six fake data plots looking at different relationships between a child and a parent. So let's imagine here we're talking about their energy expenditure. In the plot on the bottom right, the correlation coefficient is exactly one. What that means is if you know the parent's energy expenditure, you can predict with absolute certainty the child's energy expenditure. That would mean that it is entirely predictable and entirely genetic, and it would have a heritability of exactly one. On the top left is an example where there is no relationship between the parent and the child's energy expenditure. Now the correlation coefficient would be zero because you would not have any predictive value of the child's energy expenditure if you know what the parent's energy expenditure is. The other four graphs show heritabilities of 20%, 50%, 80%, and 90%. These are useful for you to keep in mind, because throughout this course, we're gonna talk about quite a few traits, and we're gonna talk about how heritable they are. So having a sense of what that might look like if you had to calculate it yourself will be really helpful. So how did we go about determining how much energy expenditure was heritable? Well, this study here from 1989 looked at a series of parents and children from both twins and non-twin environments and measured their energy expenditure experimentally. What you can see on the bar on the left is the relationship between a parent and a child's energy expenditure is quite weak. However, if you compare dizygotic twins, which are by definition gonna be the same age, you now see there's a much tighter relationship between their energy expenditure, a correlation coefficient of almost 0.4. However, if you now look at monozygotic twins, these will now be both the same age, the same sex, and very, very, very similar genetically, the correlation coefficient is much higher, almost 80%. The fact that there's a strong relationship between dizygosity, monozygosity, and the trait of interest, in this case, energy expenditure, tells us there's a very large genetic component to describing energy expenditure. 